open just some uh, leftover from last session, which we did not discuss. Uh, so one of this is the is the DOHS, the direct osmosis high salinity cleaning. This is the clinic which can be conducted. It's very effective, but it's very difficult to implement. In this clinic, we have a, before the high pressure pump, we have a super saline solution, high concentration solution, about uh, close to 18 uh, percent of sodium chloride, which we which we open the the tank uh, uh, and let the some uh, plug flow of high saline solution to flow through the system in normal operation. What happened is the osmotic pressure it's much higher than the much higher than the feed pressure, and it results that the where this uh, plug or slug of high salinity water flows through the membrane, then the, uh, there's a reverse flow. And this flow both lifts the foulant from the membrane and also the, mem the foulants are flushed out. So this is effective uh, both for the colloidal fouling and biological fouling. As I said, it's very difficult to implement the reason being is you need to the high pressure, very high pressure pump, higher pressure than here. You need, everything has to be made of a corrosion resistant stainless steel. It's expensive, but in the system which was implemented, it worked very well. Tony, uh, my audio is fine? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Let me continue. Okay, and so now we're going to process flow, uh, process, uh, uh, flow diagram. So those are the, uh, so we have uh, the basic documents for any system design. It's process flow diagram, PDF, and process and in, in instrumentation di diagram, PNID. Uh, those are the, the, the starting documents which were being updated as the pro uh, project goes along. So first of all, process flow diagram. Process flow diagram includes the schematic of the system with indication of the major documents and flow and mass balance. So looking at the process flow diagram, we know the streams, we know their uh, uh, flow rates and we know the the concentration and usually we also know the pressure. So this is the picture. If we look on this, so we know where's the starting point and where this, uh, uh, how the, the water being processed. The process and the instrumentation diagram, it's already much higher level of the details. It is still a one line diagram as the PDF. And this already has all the major, all the equipment, not the major equipment, all the equipment, all the valves. The, the is, uh, shows the piping, the valves, the, the, all the instrumentation, all the sensors, and of course the equipment. So in process, uh, the, the reference to the system is the PNID. PNID, when we have doubt, if something is included in the, in the system, we we'll look in the PNID. The next level is layout drawings. Layout drawing shows the, 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 the layout on the floor of the plant. So we, we see the trains, we see the, the, in the piping, we see how everything is related to each other on the, on the, on the floor plane. And then it's mechanical drawing. Mechanical drawing is already 1D or 3D drawings of all the equipment showing the, that we can really have the three-dimensional uh, vi visualization of the plant. Electrical system drawing is single line drawing showing the electri electric loads in the system. Now then we have the 30% pro, uh, design, 60% design, 90% design and final design. So 30% design corresponds more or less <clears throat> to the PDF with some indication of the equipment. So it's actually system sizing. The 60% design 
includes PNID and uh, uh, and all the detailed uh, uh, listing of the equipment. 90% design, it's complete design. So it includes PDF, PNID, layout drawings, mechanical drawings, electrical system drawing, everything. Final design is just correction of the 90% design. So those are the steps of the design process. And uh, after each step, 30, 60, 90% design, there is evaluation of the design. And there is a report which is sent to the engineers or to the owner or, or whatever authority it is. And the quality control of the design, it's, it's, it's uh, usually done starting from the 60% design that there is a separate uh, group of people who goes through this and checks and see if the all the there is all the equipment is there and also if there is equipment which is does should not be there and also if the flow rates are correct uh, everything is done uh, correctly now once we have final design frequently it's uh, there is the process called the step called the value engineering. Value engineering, you take the group on experts, usually not more than four to five people, each one expert in the, in the field related, of course, to the project. It could be electrician and it uh, could be also architect and mechanical uh, person and process person. And they going, uh, they spent uh, four to five days going through the, all the uh, final design and proposing improvement. As they, first of all, they have a high expertise in the process, but on the other hand, they were not involved in the previous system design. So there are advice, sometimes are good, sometimes not. But in the end, you usually accept uh, the, it's uh, about 10% of their recommendation are usually accepted and they also, provide some savings, usually saving or increased reliability of the process. Mm -hmm. I think, okay, so this will be PDF, process and flow diagram. So we have the, uh, the major equipment and shows that how the water is being treated, okay? And what chemicals being added. And also there should be table, which I just don't have the room for this, which shows the flows. This is already, another form of the PDF, process flow diagram, that again, a little maybe nicer than the previous one, but practically the same, and it will be table in the bottom with the each flow number and what is the flow, what is the salinity, what is the pressure. This is a PNID. This PNID is very simple PNID, just to show you the principle of PNID. So you have a arrow train and you have a instrumentation. Okay. This is more a, a evolved PNID, two stage arrow system. Now we see already see all the components, see the flow meters like magnetic flow meters. So we, all the instrumentation, pumps, pumps, uh, motors, if there's VFD, we'll show the VFD here. So this already tells us everything we'd like to know what is in the system, major component, we'll see it here. This is the, uh, the layout, okay? So this is the plant area and the top view, and we see the uh, membrane, uh, membrane filtration trains, membrane filtration equipment, RO equipment here with the, all the tanks for CIP, flushing and so on, chemical dosage, chemical dosing the storage here, and uh, this is UV here. So this is wastewater reclamation plant. And, uh, and uh, so sometimes if you want to show detailed view, we'll have something like this and we'll show you somewhere else. Uh, uh, what I want to say. Okay, so this is the shows us also the now if, if this is done in the cut, so we could know the distances 
between the different equipment. Uh, we can check if the forklift will pass and so on. So this is this is the floor plan, the layout of the of the plan. And this is mechanical drawing of the arrow train. So now you can see all the piping, diameter, flow direction, valves, uh, uh, pressure vessels here, and uh, high pressure pump. And so this provides uh, already the, the, this, based on this, we can, the system can be constructed or I think this is the last, yes. Okay, so let's me get out from the, from the module five. Okay, so we go out for module five, and now we go to. Okay, when I say that, okay, okay, so now we go to. Where I'm, uh, no, I don't want to do share screen. Okay, so I have to go share screen again. All right. And now go to module five. And go to this. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to module five and the module five will, disc will talk about the pilot unit configuration operation, economics of our desalination process, membrane filtration fundamentals, pressure driven membrane filtration technology, vacuum driven membrane filtration technology, and commercial uh, membrane filtration products. Okay, so Pilot unit, when we do the pilot unit, the, the objective of the pilot unit is performance verification, process optimization, product or process development. In the pilot unit configuration, we could have segment, which is of interest to us, or full process testing. Pilot unit testing program, we, sh we should evaluation of results, performance, reliability, and economics. The evaluation of results is the most important part of the pilot unit. What, fr what sometimes happens with pilot unit that we run pilot unit and we wait with the evaluation of result to the very end. This is the worst error one can make because very frequently in the end we'll find results which we did not results we, we are interested in. in all the pilot efforts which are very expensive, very disruptive, were for nothing. And then there is no other opportunity to the pilot again. So the objective is verifiability of pretreatment to produce consistent feed water quality. This is usually the most frequent reason to do the pilot, to conduct pilot in operation. Sometimes determine the dosage rate and verify, verify computability of pretreatment chemical. This is less frequent, but sometimes for the coagulation, we can do it. Verify membrane performance. Today, we're not doing this anymore for the normal operation, but we can do it for the wastewater if we want, if the membrane can operate with the high concentration of organic matter. So every membrane which will be eventually used in the wastewater reclamation system has to be, their performance has to be verified. And if you say have like, place like B, uh, uh, PUB, or uh, place like Orange County Water District, which have extensive wastewater operation, they will not just buy the membrane. They will buy a number of uh, elements to fill one, two pressure vessels, operate them for a year, compare with the rest of the plant, and then decide that if they're going in the, in the future membrane replacement, they're going to include this membrane in the list of the membrane which can of the membrane manufacturer who can bid for the for the project. Otherwise, it was frequently happened the membrane in such a 
case will fail. So this pilot operation is definitely it's required, and this is very important. Also for the for the shallow well nanofiltration, not all nanofiltration membranes are the same. So again, and the the water contains organics. So for this, some cases, some project, the the membrane the supplier it's uh, obligated to run the pilot unit. Or let's say industrial. Industrial, you always have to write, write, run pilot unit because industrial streams can have anything there and not all the membrane can work. Optimize process design. Well, sometimes you want to, let's say, a optimize cleaning. So yes, you will have a small pilot unit with one element pressure vessel and try to optimize cleaning process there. Verify contribution of very cost components to water cost. It's not very frequently done, but sometimes you can see how much different uh, different chemicals you have to add and pressure, what pressure you have to operate. It can be done not very frequently, but uh, to uh, all one, two, three, and four, those are uh, especially three, maybe one, two, three, those three objectives are very frequently and good reason to run the pilot unit. So the, the pilot unit uh, has a, a, a pilot unit has its own uh, logistic and cost. First of all, logistic site selection. Uh, the pilot unit for the new plant is done in the place there is nothing. There is no, usually no access road, no electricity, no water, no place to discharge wastewater. And then the, the let's say that this is brackish, you have to, or nano, for nano filtration. So the well may be there, but except well, there is nothing else. So it's a, so this is the problem. So you have to the play and also so in addition to provide all the utilities, electricity, uh, feed water supply, and uh, and uh, discharge of the concentrate. You also have to provide security. Have to the system has to be the uh, the place has to be fenced, has to be locked. And now, usually today, pilot unit do not have continuous presence of the operators. Uh, they coming from time to time, and also there is a remote data collection, a remote surveillance. So setting all this is very, very expensive. Now there's a pilot unit by itself. A full uh, blown pilot unit can cost 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars easily. So uh, as a new unit. So usually it's better to rent it for a number of months. And uh, uh, rather than buy the unit because pilot unit usually lasts uh, uh, for the for the period of time that we what we interested in the uh, feed water quality, and there's the process engineering how the system should be configured. We have to secure labor laboratory testing, so we have to have uh, where we're going to send the sample, how we're going to collect the sample, uh, and how frequently operation maintenance. So that's a uh, very as I said, usually we don't have continuous operation, everything is done remotely, but we have to send some, someone uh, daily or maybe every two days just to check if the, if the pilot unit still works, if someone didn't come and, and stole some uh, part of the equipment, which can happen on such a remote site. And also if something break, breaks, there is an issue of maintenance. So for the pilot unit, we have to have spare equipment almost for everything, because if not, again, system is down until we get the equipment to replace. We're not collecting data, we're not operating. The valuable, a very expensive time is being lost. Data collection, it's usually done uh, by online, uh, but the, then again, we want operator to come from time to time, maybe every two days, and check the data manually. This way, he goes through the pilot unit 
and checks are in the equipment and we know if the equipment works or not. Okay, so if we want to do full-fledged pilot unit, which mean uh, mimic the operation of the of the of the plant, commercial plant, it's prohibitively expensive. It's so expensive that uh, usually there is no money in the project for this. But we can test critical components. So, for example, we can test part of the pretreatment, media filtration. We can test the uh, operation of the pretreatment and the lead element, okay? Uh, maybe with recirculation, can take on the operation of the, of the pretreatment and simulate the, the operation of the last element. So everything has to be done in the smart way because usually we do not need to full-fledged pilot unit operation of the to mimic the complete plant, we need critical components which we're not sure. Okay, so application usually could be seawater brackish or membrane filtration. We need the feed water supply, we need pretreatment unit, arrow unit, small size element, and post treatment unit. Post treatment again, so if we want just post treatment, we have to find the source of the low salinity water and just test post treatment. We have to be innovative and sorry not innovative creative in way to be doing to save money and to do it in the way which will project will benefit and will not uh, put too much burden on the project cost okay and what is the uh, uh, now when we operate the on the other hand when we operate the part of the equipment, the, this equipment should operate in the process parameters of the commercial plant. So that could be if we want to know if the, if the concept, if the, there will be scaling, we have to operate the last element in the same flux as we'll do in the commercial system. So this is something that's required interstage booster. So, uh, and if you operate the filtration unit, it should be operate in the same uh, filtra uh, filtration flux, the same intervals between backwash and so on. So this is just a picture of the seawater unit. This was, uh, uh, you can see two pressure vessel seawater units. It has a membrane filtration unit here as a pretreatment. Uh, this is the the cleaning, uh, this high pressure pump, uh, and I think this is the cleaning thing. Now, in this, uh, okay, so let's see the so the, this this was seawater pilot unit to operate for a number for years, and the is the truth is it was a. a Okay, so as you can see, you have two pressure vessels. The reason being that uh, they wanted to simulate operation eight elements per vessel. The truth is this, the payload uh, results were so-so. Uh, it was more for the public relation to show to people that you can produce, take the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and uh, produce potable water. In the plant, they, they very little they provide they they provide very little consideration for the pilot unit result just based on the operation of the seawater plant and other location so this was here just for the public relation not so much but nevertheless this pilot unit cost uh, two hundred thousand dollars okay but let's say the example of the pilot unit operation we have a pilot unit operation we want to see if the which membrane has the best nitrate performance, so we test elements A, B, and C, and we also want to operate at the recovery rate, so we add one pressure, so we have pressure vessels A, B, and C, add pressure vessels for to simulate concentrate uh, operation. The pretreatment will be either media filter or without without filtration because it's well water scale inhibitor 
and cartridge filter, high pressure pump, and so on. This was the, this would be the one, and in this we would operate the, we compared up the performance nitrate rejection, all the three types of elements, and also we we'll see if this uh, feed water we can operate without media filtration. So initially we operate with media filtration, after without it. We'll use different scale inhibitor to see if there is any scaling, just measuring by pressure drop in the last element. Okay, this is another example of the, of the pilot operation. This is in the seawater system. So this, this demonstrates the arrow train and we take connect to the single element pressure vessels connected to the feed line after a high pressure pump. And uh, the permeate could go either, this is little permeate could go to waste or could be connected with the permeate of the, of the regular plant. The concentrate goes to waste, of course. And from time to time, we open this valve, close this valve, measure the permit flow. So the process parameters, feed is the same feed as the commercial plant, temperature. So it's the same salinity, the same temperature, the same pressure. And this uh, represents operation of the lead element. And by measuring the, let's say, calcium or chloride in the feed and concentrate and permit, we can calculate the recovery rate. We can follow up on permeability. So we can follow up on salt passage, stability of salt passage and permeability. So this unit does not require high pressure pump. So it's very inexpensive to install and it and can be used, first of all, to test, to test the elements in the, in the pressure vessel. So let's say we, we want to do cleaning so we could test the uh, all eight elements one by one in this unit and one of two pressure vessels. And then we know where we have the most of the foulant. Also, if such element is uh, connected to the small uh, cleaning unit, we can test effectiveness of cleaning. So uh, now on the other hand, if we want to evaluate which uh, elements will be good for the next replacement, also for the replacement, we can measure the performance of the elements along the pressure vessels for number of pressure vessels. So for the replacement, we'll know how many elements we have to replace in order to restore, we can calculate this, in order to restore performance of the plant. On the other hand, if you want to see the performance of the elements of other manufacturer before the next replacement, we'll just load those uh, elements in one or two uh, pressure vessels and operate them and measure. Uh, and then after a while, we'll take the elements from the, this test pressure vessel, again, testing single element uh, test unit. Okay. All right. Uh, so testing probably determine the wet water composition. And when we test pretreatment, we have to test pretreatment during the seasonal fluctuation of raw water quality. We have to test during the time when we know the feed water quality will be the worst. Otherwise, there is no point. And we should operate in the, in the highest recovery, which we designed for the for the plant operation and maybe add another 10%. And permit post-treatment, if necessary, we can test. And also testing effectiveness of clinic procedure. But for this, we have to first create condition of fouling the elements, so then we test the cleaning. The very important, maintain detailed log of unit operation and evaluation system availability online factor. And this, so, we have to also evaluate the, the analytical results, normalize per membrane performance, determine of performance trends. We have to follow operation of the pilot unit daily. If not, you're wasting money, wasting time. In the end, we will not have 
anything valuable getting from the program. And also we should have high online factor. Remember, <clears throat> if the, any part of the pilot unit is down, pilot unit stop operation. And you have, let's say, pilot unit is very expensive. You have operation budget for three months. Uh, uh, you, in the, you may end up uh, operating this just for two weeks because every time some else broke. So we have to have a maintenance people and you also have the spare equipment more than you need in normal plant so anything happen you immediately you replace you do not wait for the delivery just replace and go on okay so this was the nitrate rejection so pretreatment requirements i already discussed this we have to verify nitrate rejection so we'll have the Let's say that will be for 10 months operation. We operated recovery 75, 80, 85, 90 to see if we can scale foul the membrane using scent filter and not using, using, not using, see if there is a difference in operation. Cartridge filter using all the time, scale inhibitor one and scale inhibitor two and see which one provides better stability. So reading analytical testing, the daily reading of flows, conductivity, pressure, fit temperature, turbidity, operating hours. So this is to a normal operation, uh, normal uh, uh, parameters of the every plant also applies to the pilot plant. Biweekly sample of chemicals would determine nitrate and conductivity, weekly normalization performance, report after completion of each experimental segment. We finish segment, we, we evaluate all the data, write the report, send for the approval and go to the next one. So this one will have the reliable data which will have some meaning for us. So with performance verification, the process optimization, product or process development. So application type could be brackish or nanofiltration, seawater, wastewater reclamation. We could have a process segment of full process testing. So this will be the instrumentation which we'll have in the, in the pilot unit. I will not read you all of this, you can read yourself, but it basically means that we need more instrumentation even than the commercial plant because we have to have all the data all the data that we can that will we can evaluate and understand the, if the process will work or we we'll have to improve it. Uh, so for the site, we have to have level leveled surface. We have the weather protection storage area. When we keep the spare equipment and chemicals, we need security and access road. We need permit to operate equipment, to store chemicals, to discharge water stream. Without permit, we cannot operate pilot unit. We need supply of feed water, ability to discharge raw water, permit and concentrate. Also to ability to discharge preservation chemicals. And we need supply of electricity. We need a labor to visit the plant and check on the plant and maybe do the maintenance operation and spare parts. I already mentioned we need more spare parts than commercial system because we cannot wait for this part to arrive. We have to just be able to replace and continue the operation. So if necessary, we should have uh, for the major equipment like pump and maybe and, and, and a sensor instruments, we need maybe two of each in order to be able to, uh, to operate properly. Okay, so some picture, this is the picture of the previous was the a, a N, a MF and the RO pilot unit combined together. And this is pilot of the media filtration, which is for the seawater. So we have the, we have the dosing, the static mixer, flocculator, media will have the, uh, because we may not have hydraulic profile, we're using siphon with the vacuum pump to move water from flocculator to a media filtration storage and the backwash is going there and then we have to have permit to discharge this backwash. This is another pilot. This is the full, uh, the uh, UF RO unit, NF unit, and uh, this is the pilot to test a NF operation to test removal of color, iron, and manganese from the 
lake water. And this is done in, this pilot actually was run in Alaska. So the, so this is the, this is the commercial plan, okay? But the pilot was like this. We just use cartridge for the cartridge filter uh, for, for the pretreatment, UF membrane, a, a pressure vessel, small elements, NF membrane, and green sand column, okay? And this is how it looks like. So I can see in this case, the, the pilot is very inexpensive, contains all the major components because we're not interested here on the process parameters. We just want to know if the we can produce good water quality using this, proce this uh, 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 process steps, okay? Cut UF, NF, oh yeah, maybe greens and potassium permanganate dosing. Okay, so this is the operation. So you can see this is the uh, raw water. Uh, this is the iron, color iron and uh, and manganese. And what is important to see in the, in the NF, what we're getting after NF. So you can see the, in each case, the NF removes color, there's no problem. It removes iron, there's no problem. There's the problem with the manganese. So the manganese should be less than 0, 0, 0.05, and you see it's higher, sometimes very high. A, Okay, but in green sand we can remove this, we can remove this everything. So uh, in case when you have zero you, you, without green sand, we were able to operate using potassium peroxidase using potassium permanganate when we have a, a sufficient detention time. We determined the detention, required detention time was half an hour. In cases when we did not have potassium permanganate, we were using green sand, it also worked. So this was the pilot unit which provides the justification for this type of the, of the operation. Membrane filtration, adding uh, potassium permanganate, detention tank, membrane filtration, NF, and product water, okay. Oh, economics of the arrow process. The arrow process is the process which, which requires energy, chemicals, and other consumable. Okay, so each step, in some step, we, we require pretreatment require little energy, but a lot of chemicals, arrow, little chemicals, but a, a lot of energy and other consumable. And the post treatment, little energy, a lot of chemicals again. So the components of the capital cost, the project development cost, engineering services, direct construction cost, financing cost, contingency, OEM cost, and operation maintenance cost could be variable cost, which is power chemicals, replacement of membrane and waste disposal. So this, when we operate this cost, we incur this cost. If we do not operate, we still incur costs of labor, maintenance, regulatory monitoring, and indirect OEM costs. So direct costs include site preparation and building, intake and outfall, pretreatment, arrow trains, membrane elements, piping, high pressure pumps, electrical, pretreatment, membrane cleaning, instrumentation. So all the equipment and the site preparation and building and bringing stuff together, it's the direct cost. Indirect cost, contingency, engineering, owner cost, interest during construction. Owner cost is the cost with the owner incurred during the, during the, all the process of building, construct, of designing, building, construction and plant. And then the, on addition, the plant usually, usually, uh, financed by loans or uh, some interest rates. So during the construction, there is interest during construction has to be paid. So the owner or whoever developer wants to build the plan has to, has to all the money secured because he can start the project. So let's say capital cost calculation, we have system capacity 200,000, system cost 250 million, interest rate six, system life 20 years, plant load factor 95. So interest charges is, this is the formula. 
and this is the n is projected uh, system life and uh, i is interest so capital cost contribution to the water cost will be this cost of the of the uh, the cost of the plant cost at the interest rate six percent the compound interest for which we have to return money it's from it's go based on six percent in 20 years 8.72 okay so 8.72 percent divided by the capacity divided by 365 divided by times load uh, times 365 times load factor this is the quantity of water which we produce in a year so dividing this uh, interest cost by this uh, total capacity we're getting the 31 cents per cubic meter for this plant will be just to return the, the to return the pay the interest on the loan for the construction so uh, so we could have the same uh, this is the present wars the present wars is the it describes okay let me explain this way let's say that we have to pay have to budget fifty thousand dollars every year for the membrane to after the to be able to replace all the membranes after uh, uh, seven years so altogether we need three hundred fifty thousand uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the for the membrane replacement so we have to budget we, we do not put this money if we would if we to have this and the end of the project three hundred fifty thousand dollars we don't need to put in the bank three hundred fifty thousand dollars we put smaller amount because bank will pay us interest so this is the present wars so this in press, press, uh, present wars is the cost of the money which we'll spend later, okay? We'll be spent during the duration of the product. So this was calculated as, uh, this is the equation for the calculate, but some costs could have escalation, okay? If there's escalation, let's say, the, the we assume that the power cost will go up, some chemical costs will go, go up, uh, and other supplies will go up. So we know we assume some escalation based on the historical data, one, two, three percent per year. So this is the current value. This is the projected system life, interest rate, pr price escalation rate. So this is the example that we calculate the operating cost, present value calculating that quantity per year and the unit cost, total annual cost. So we have all the annual cost and present value, the present value factor for the whole life of the project with, uh, without price escalation based on the 5% interest rate is 12.46. So just multiply uh, uh, by 12.46 if there's no price installation. So annual cost four million uh, five something end up for the total project cost 56 million with price in, uh, escalation of three percent will uh, some component will end up 72 so this is how we compare different process alternative by using this uh, present worth value this is how we compare the membrane cost the the cost of the pumping equipment uh, so this is uh, the way of doing this with or without price escalation. Operating costs, we have chemicals, so we have chemicals, cartridge filter replacement, power, raw water delivery costs, pretreatment, high pressure pumps, permit pumps, and auxiliary. So the power, power comes from the, uh, from all these one, two, three, four, five, five uh, major components. There's a membrane replacement, maintenance, spare parts, and operation labor. What are the economic drivers in brackish row? In brackish row, the raw, raw water supply, there's cost of developing raw water supply, feed water salinity in composition because this affects pressure, scaling consideration limits the recovery rate, how much it costs discharge of concentrate, permitting, 
and fluctuation of demand. If there is in the demand, it fluctuates over the year, different summer or winter, for example, then we have to adjust our economics accordingly. So the brackish cost data, if we go capacity 5,000, 19,000 or 95,000, the equipment cost per, per cubic meter uh, goes down and uh, uh, the cost of the plant also goes down, operating and maintenance goes also down. So the, there's the economics of size, the larger plants cost less per unit water, per unit capacity cost less to operate. Uh, so this is an example of the 5,000 and 20,000 cubic meter per day, and we use the system components, will be membrane filtration, arrow equipment, other equipment. In the end, we get the specific cost, which is almost half, going from four times capacity, the cost is half, okay, specific cost. So though the, for large capacity breakage plan, those are the range of the, of the components, capital cost, electric power, and the membrane replacement. In the end, we end up, uh, in the end up in the range of 0.27 to 0.43 of total cost dollar per cubic meter which is uh, depends very much on the location and and some it's the the labor plays a big role in this and also other costs and contingency because this includes also permitting and monitoring in some places the monitoring is very expensive both for the brackish and seawater so in the brackish uh, plan the Capital cost could be about 55%, energy 20%, and the other smaller components. In drivers in seawater, it's seawater supply. Because can we use intake? Have to use the uh, beach wells. So this will affect very much system cost. Feed water salinity, quality in salinity. If salinity is very high, we'll have to operate at very high pressure. Quality, if there is frequently storms, then we have to have more extensive pretreatment. If the water is very clean, we pretreatment, less pretreatment required. So feed water pretreatment, this is the very important cost parameters. Permit water quality requirements. Do we need the boron limitation? We need definitely we need second pass. We need the very low salinity. Yes, we need second pass. And of course, we have to stabilize the water discharge of concentrate. Can we discharge directly? Can we have to have a very long tunnel to discharge concentrate. If we do, then we need proper hydraulic gradients. We're using uh, the, the power consumption of the plant will be higher. Permitting. In some uh, countries, permitting is very costly operation. Costing millions and millions of dollars to permit and also to follow up on uh, all, all the, do the, all the tests required in permitting. Fluctuation of demand. This is the important factor in the uh, project cost. Very frequently, the places when you build the salination plant, there are seasonal high demand and low demand. High demand usually is in summer, just because of the high temperature, but also some places tourists are coming and those are major reason to having the salination plant. There is very little demand in winter. Also could be rainy season and dry season. So usually there is the agreement between the entity which operates the plant and the customer uh, of taker of the water. And there will basic uh, uh, this the, the the owner the customer will pay some basic fee all the time and on top of it will pay according to demand okay and this way the both sides are protected and the both because people who develop have to have have to have make money from the from the project and the customer wants to pay as much as he uses not just paying all the time the lot amount 
money. So this is very important consideration in the any desalination water treatment project. So in the current seawater application using membrane with lower salt transport and higher water permeability, you remember maybe the module one, we discussed this, uh, try to operate op optimum recovery rate, which is, as I said, between 40 to 55% using uh, pumps and motors, energy equipment with very high efficiency to reduce energy consumption. Increased number of elements per vessel from six to seven, now it's already eight. Most, but on the, this is on the positive side. The negative side, more stringent permit quality requirements, including limits on boron concentration in permit. We have more efficient two-pass operation, remember split partial. And sometimes in some plant utilization of power plant discharge as a feed water. This is very seldom done. When it's done, it does not require intake, but creates other problems. As I showed to you, the power plant does not care what quality water he receives for the RO system. It's important. So there is the issue of the, could be issue at some periods of the, of the year. Membrane pretreatment. Membrane pretreatment is a little controversial issue. We'll discuss this in this module soon. It's removes all the colloidal matter and there is water, it has no colloidal matter. The problem is, one problem, it uses hypochlorite during the backwash process and this has to be flushed out and not to reach the membrane, but also this hypochlorite break, breaks organics and some organics end up in RIRO. The other is, so in the end, this membrane pretreatment could result in biofouling in the RO process. So this is something which is not completely resolved. It's almost given that you have membrane pretreatment in seawater. I'm talking about the seawater. In seawater, because in the wastewater rec uh, reclamation, this is the only pretreatment we are using. But in seawater, that could be problems. So that has to be addressed. On one hand, you're getting very good quality. On the other hand, possibility of biofouling. So if this has to be monitoring closely and prevent at all costs. All right, so those are the water costs. As you can see, the water cost ranges usually below $1 uh, per cubic meter, but you have to remember this is the initial cost, the first cost. All the costs have indexed according to the energy cost and the cost of the consumable. So after a few years, it goes over $1. So this is the cost for the contract years. Today, I mean, this ends up 2010, but today it's not different. We have all the cost in this range. Uh, point, uh, okay, let's point 0.65, point 0.85, somewhere here. This is the range also today for all the projects. So how we optimize uh, capital cost? Uh, we have to go by the seasonal capacity demand and design system accordingly based on the feed water salinity and fluctuation, power cost and power rate structure. Depending on power cost, we can buy more or less expensive uh, pumping equipment, energy recovery, optimize recovery rate, permit quality, try to use post-treatment process, which will be low cost, flux rate, this, this we don't have that much uh, flexibility because we go by the application, chemical cost, try to get chemicals at the lowest possible cost. And so for this, you have to see if you want to use the solid chemical, dissolve on site or liquid solution, then it pay for the water transport and what distance you're going to transport. Membrane replacement rate and cost. Membrane replacement does, do not represent high cost of the system operation, but membrane replacement creates a lot of uh, uh, disruption to plant operation. So this has to be done also in the smart way. So the number of operators which we need, which determines very much labor cost, depends on the size of the plant. And for the large low plants, we need four to six, small plants, four to six, very large, 30 to 40. Uh, some plants are bigger than this. Today, they have a plants of 600,000 cubic meter per day. 
So this will be something which will go in aseptic way, not necessarily you will have much more, need much more operators for the much larger plant, but you may need more maintenance people, not more, so much labor, but more maintenance in people, you need less administration. So I would say if you go three times bigger plant, maybe the number of operators will be just, I don't know, 50% uh, higher. Okay, so we could have the low operating cost and high construction cost or equipment cost on the opposite. So we're always looking to some optimum, what is the uh, cost we want to be, and then we make some compromise between the type of the equipment and the, and the way we operate to go to the, to the optimum cost. And this is done through the through the number of exercise when we run projection, we run the scenarios of the different equipment which will be used and okay. Okay, so this shows that the, the higher the salinity and the, the energy consumption goes up and also function recovery, higher recovery, higher energy consumption. So in the seawater cost, the EPC cost, you have all the components the there is a intake uh, engineering. So this is the cost of the construction. So you don't. There is no one cost which is which is really the highest. But you see the engineering and overhead is twenty percent. The other big is owner cost, which is related to the uh, to the uh, borrowing money and paying all the expenses during the construction. Intake cost could be significant, something this here is just 7%, but could be much bigger if the sub, subsurface intake is required. Okay, in the total work contribution, you see the capital cost, is, which was brackish, was 58, now it's 41. Energy becomes significant cost out of, and this is the distribution of the cost, so we have between the total cost 0 0.52 to 0 0.78. Again, contingency, significant cost, electric power. Capital cost and electric power, the big contributors uh, to, the, to the water cost. And the power cost, the, the high pressure pump has 78%. So uh, the other cost components are much lower. This is provided that your per product has to be pumped in a relatively short distance. But the high pressure pump, this is, uh, this is the major user of the electricity. When the system operates, of, the system operates at pressure uh, 60 to sometimes 80 bar. Okay, so we can reduce this, the, theoretically we could reduce this uh, energy but operating at lower pressure, but there is a concentrate osmotic pressure. We need to some NDP above the osmotic pressure. So there is some pressure limit we cannot go below. Okay, so operating costs, we have acidification, adding of ferric, uh, cartridge replacement, energy of the pretreatment, high pressure pump, permit pump, and some auxiliary. Membrane replacement, the replacement rate 10 to 20 per year, maintenance expenses one to two of capital cost and labor 3%. Power uh, 35 to 45% of total water cost. Okay, so this is the just example of the wastewater reclamation plant, the chemical cost. We want to calculate the, the cost of chemicals. So we have to start with sizing of the plant, sizing of the flows. Without it, we cannot do it. So we starting with, we know that the capacity is 25,000 cubic meter per day, and plant will be 90% line factor, recover rate 85%, number of trays, number of pressure vessels. And uh, now we need the, the net permit capacity, it's, higher than the nominal. Why is the, the it's higher? Because we need the permit for cleaning. So we have to calculate the how much water we need for cleaning. 
and this goes by the number of uh, uh, cleanings per year, trains in operation, number of pressure vessels, and you already know that each pressure vessel will need eight cubic meter per vessel, okay? And uh, so then from, and we need, we want this, uh, okay, let's see, let's not, uh, okay. So this provides us the total volume per year, okay, number of cleaning and, and flush water, so both together with average. Uh, so this is the, the, fl the additional permit we have to produce annually to, for the flush and for the, for the cleaning, okay, and uh, so the average is six cubic meter per day. We have to add and multiply by two just to the safety factor. And then you have all the other flows, and then we calculate the use of the of the chemicals. So each uh, chemical, citric acid, sodium tripolyphosphate, and NOH sodium, dodecylbenzene, sulfonate detergent, and, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so we do this, uh, all this calculation of the, of the quantity of chemicals per, per CIP, kilograms per liter, and then we go for the, this is for the CIP, and then the other chemicals we can use for the operation. So we have the concentration, has specific gravity, and <coughs> excuse me, dosing, dosing and liter per hour, according based on the on the dosing rate, concentration, and and specific gravity or density. So we have membrane filtration, RO, advanced oxidation process, post treatment, and we have total. And then from this we go to the cost. We know the concentration, you know, the density, you know, how much uh, dollar per ton, and we're using the, the or dollar per ton or dollar per liter if this is liquid, and then we use the annual cost based on the previous uh, quantities, and then contribution to the water cost. So in the end, you have this uh, point one. You have this example in the spreadsheet I sent to some of you. So you can follow up, can follow up the calculation. Okay, so now we move to the next subject, which is membrane filtration, which is extremely important for the wastewater reclamation and also for potable water production. It's some importance for the seawater, but as I said, Seawater has his, its problematics, so it has to be, if you decided to use membrane filtration for the seawater RO, you have to be very mindful that you have to follow up and prevent biofoul. Okay, so uh, UF MF application, UF is ultra filtration, MF membrane filtration, microfiltration, sorry, no. But generally we're calling this membrane filtration, everything, both UF and microfiltration. So you can call it, we'll call it membrane filtration because in the actual operation, it really doesn't matter what using QF or ultrafiltration or microfiltration. So we could use potable application, removal of colloids and pathogens, oxidation, removal of iron and manganese. Pretreatment of RO feed water, municipal wastewater, the, uh, it's really must, seawater, with caution, industrial RO treating surface water. This system uses all of them, sorry, not all of them, majority of them using membrane filtration. Membrane bioreactors, of course, and there's industrial application. Industrial application, the membrane for special type of processes. This is, we'll not discuss this, I just mentioned that this also exists. So in the same way as we have in the our net driving pressure here with transmembrane pressure, but here we do not, uh, there is no uh, uh, term of osmotic pressure because the membrane filtration does not concentrate any ions, does not reject, does not concentrate, all the, whatever is dissolved will pass through the, uh, through the membrane filtration. So the TMP is P, uh, pressure at the feet, pressure at the concentrate, if they, we go cross flow divided by two minus permit pressure, 
okay? Specific permeability, again, is fil filtered flow rate divided by, by area divided, uh, divided by TMP, transmembrane pressure. So there is a big difference between the operation at the, during the testing or during the field condition to the, to the extent that the new membrane flux is irrelevant practically because the moment they start operate, uh, operating, it fouls almost immediately and it goes down by more than three times. So this is, we just want the membrane of good permeability to operate well at the low pressure, uh, the low temperature, but uh, it's not so relevant. You have like the same way as you have correction for the RO, temperature correction. <coughs> you have also correction, temperature correction in the membrane filtration. Though the RO, the reference point of one was 25 degrees, in the membrane filtration is 20 degrees. And this is the temperature. So all everything here is in centigrade in the in the uh, in the in the RO we were using uh, uh, absolute temperature. Okay, so for the temperature twenty percent uh, twenty six uh, twenty six degree, we have correction factor of eighty three. So we need just 83% of TMP required at 20. So like in the RO, higher temperature, higher permeability. Okay, so temperature correction factor, 120 degrees. Uh, how we calculate the membrane flux? The same way as we did with the RO. We have the system capacity. We have the number of membrane modules. We know each membrane module, what membrane area it has the filtration capacity times 1000 divided by 24 between number of modules, membrane area, 84 liter per square meter per hour. Now, if we want the other way, let's say we want to operate system at 100, uh, filtrate flux at 100 liter per square meter per hour, and we, this, this is the system capacity, so we again convert to liter divided 24 divided 46 divided by filtration flux 892 elements so the same as we did with RO. Now this is the sentence here the actual flux it's always higher than the nominal flux you will see that soon why is this but this is not like RO. RO this is nominal flux this is how we operate in the membrane filtration it's it's different actually totally different Molecular weight cutoff is just an academic term. It's, we're not using this normal operation, but it says that the, this is the, the size of the molecule that membrane will reject at 90%. So, okay, so that's where the membrane rejects 90%, 10 to minus um, I don't know, 100,000. Uh, so this will be molecular weight cutoff here, will be 100,000 for this type of membrane. Okay, in the microfiltration, so the ultrafiltration, the range, the pore size is, is that size, 001 to 002 micron, the microfiltration 01 to 04. However, it has to be said that uh, both membranes foul during the static operation because we operate at 100% recovery, there is no cross flow. So regardless if this is ultrafiltration, microfiltration membrane, they plug immediately and all the membrane, the pores, they actually acts like the ultrafiltration membrane. So based on diffusion, there's almost all the pores are blocked very shortly after startup of operation. Okay, so this is the filtration spectrum, which everyone knows. So the, uh, Media filtration here, microfiltration here, ultrafiltration here. But as I said, once the system operates, every microfiltration, everything moves somewhere here. And ceramic membrane is the same as the other polymeric membrane. RO, of course, is the only RO in the NF, the only membrane which rejects ion, dissolve ion. Those microfiltration, ultrafiltration, ceramic filtration do not reject dissolved ions, do not reject ions, period. 
Okay, so have the membrane, we apply feet, the pressure, the water pass through and the particles and viruses left behind. This is Giardia and Cryptosporodium. Uh, so the Giardia is uh, uh, it's bigger, Cryptosporodium is smaller, and they are much bigger than the microfiltration pores. So also microfiltration membrane will reject Giardia and Cryptosporodium. What are the common membrane materials? Cellulose acetate, polysulfon, polyethersulfon, polyacrylonitrile, poly PVDF, polyvilidien fluoride, polypropylene, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride. Okay, those three, the last three, uh, we use ones that are not used anymore. Cellulose acetate is being used maybe by one company, Aquasource, also marginal application. The polysulfon less, what is used mainly today, polyethersulfon, polyacrylonitrile, and the leading one is PVDF. This is one, the material polymer of choice for the majority of the membrane, but polyethersulfon is actually also not bad. Okay, so we'll have five minutes. Okay, let me see, now we go to chat. No, it doesn't open. Okay, I want to see chat. Where is this chat? I don't see chat. No. Tony, I cannot see chat. Why is this? Yes, there's just one question. Okay. Like from Gilbert. <clears throat> What do you think uh, of the latest water cost reported for very large projects like SOREC2 with 0.413 dollars uh, cubic meter in Israel or Juvail uh, or even uh, 0.306 for Hassian? Should we anticipate uh, a downward trend on prices? No, we should not. Actually, okay, there are, that has to be seen in the in the right uh, context, this uh, this uh, uh, they should be seen in the right context. First of all, the countries like Saudi Arabia they have very low power cost. Okay, I don't know what is the now, but usually it was time. It was one two cents per per kilowatt hours. So this is the one contributor. The other contributor is that now we'll have finally we have a. a uh, plant and operate based on the that customer is buying water. Previously in these countries, the customer was operating the plants and the plants were operated very inefficiently. Now, also in Sorek, the this is the initial uh, first year uh, uh, water cost, which is with index escalation index for the power equipment and chemicals. But I think this is as low as they can go. They cannot go any lower. So in the, I think that the overall we will see the price stabilization that will be initial cost will be between, I don't know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 dollar per cubic meter. And this is the range we can expect. Now, this is in the countries which have a normal uh, environmental regulation. In countries like United States, where the environmental regulations are extremely strict, or Australia, when there is this huge concern about the removing marine life, the projects can, the project, the, the in United States, the Carlsbad project, which is uh, in California, the water cost is, I think, like 1.5, close to $2 per cubic meter, only because that the permitting of the plan took almost 20 years. And only monitoring the water quality, the seawater quality, not even the, not the permit water quality, the seawater quality, I think is three or five dollars annually. It's three or five million dollars annually, okay? So, and in uh, places like California or United States, there are environmental groups that just don't want desalination period. 
they are concerned about the taking the feed, the seawater, returning the concentrate, and they coming with the lawsuit every time. And the, for them to file the lawsuit cost about five thousand dollars. For the developer to to defend, cost fifty hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so so I would say the. You will see the places like Middle East, Israel, not sure about the Europe. The prices will stabilize. In the Australia, the prices were high, will stay high. United States probably will stay high also. Okay, so we'll have a 15 minutes break. We'll meet half in, uh, in 15 minutes, half to the hour, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. So those are the membrane polymers, which we just discussed. So let me just get, I'm not getting, okay. No. Laser polymer. Okay. All right, so what we want from the polymer to have high porosity, narrow pore distribution, high polymer strength, because the membrane are exposed to, to vi pressure changes and the vibration good polymer flexibility and important permanent hydrophilic character, which is difficult to get, but a membrane manufacturing modifying the surface to get it. Wide range of pH stability for cleaning, good chlorine tolerance also for cleaning, of course, low cost, which is not always comes together. So prefer membrane materials today, PVDF, this is the most uh, common one polysulfone, polyethersulfone, polyacrylonitrile, and then also, of course, ceramic membranes. Membrane, uh, all, not the all the membrane, majority of the membrane, or for the membrane filtration, are capillary membrane. But except for a Kubota, which is flat sheet, and also for ceramic membrane which are not capillary, just actually sheet of the ceramics. But for the capillary membrane, we could have a, actually for any, uh, for the capillary membrane, we could have uh, the filtrate, that, sorry, not filtrate, the feed water is coming inside the lumen and as the pressure is pushed out, outside the lumen, or the feed water comes outside the lumen and it's pulled by the vacuum inside the lumen. So it will be outside in, inside out. The, out, uh, the inside out, the, all the membranes are pressure driven. For the, uh, for the in, uh, inside, sorry, what did I say? Okay, from the, uh, from the in, inside, outside in, that could be either vacuum driven or pressure driven. Okay, so this is the capillary, example of the capillary. And as you can see, it's uh, asymmetric. It means it's made of the same, all the fibers made of the same material. And this is the, 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 the barrier is of the same material, but dense. So it's just process with by exposure to air, exposure to gas, or some other treatment that will have this dense uh, membrane area on this side, if this is in, uh, uh, inside out, on this side it will be outside in. Okay, And this is the barrier. So this is the lumen and the pressure uh, force water out of the lumen to filtrate getting here. And the, uh, the, the outside in will be the opposite direction. The pressure will be here or the vacuum will be here. Okay, this is the module which have feed, concentrate and filtrate in, in, in the middle. This one is uh, inside out. So the feed enters into the, the capillary filtrate is forced out, collected in the filtrate tube, okay? So those uh, uh, two configuration, I wouldn't say technologies, but configuration, uh, uh, pressure driven inside out and pressure driven outside in, okay? So the membrane is on the lumen inside or, outs or outside. 
backwards uh, flux three to four times the forward flux in the uh, outside in only one five to two times forward flux earth covering it's not possible here but it's possible here advantage better protects inside fiber so it means that the that the membrane the barrier is better protected because it's inside fi fiber and but on the other hand the outside in has higher membrane area actually twice as higher for the same number of uh, capillaries because we just compared the membrane area inside lumen and outside and outside so the outside membrane is bigger so those membrane even though the the membrane material the weight is maybe the same in the module but the, the membrane area is twice this can be backwash with the only with the water is sufficient backwash in in the outside in the the the, the backwash the reduced backwash can be can, it's used which is very important because uh, the water used for the backwash is filtrate, which is the water loss. So if you're using, you will need less water for the backwash. The, this is the big advantage for the technology. Small, uh, on the other hand, for the clinic solution, you can use a small volume. And this is also. Now, in addition to this, we could have pressurized, which could be, as I said, inside out, outside in, or immerse only outside in okay so this is uh, uh, there are uh, in the one major difference is the availability of tmp in the pressure driven the tmp can be applied with some limitation but it could go even over one bar okay in the immerse which is driven vacuum the vacuum cannot be higher than negative uh, one bar, but we cannot operate in, uh, in one bar because it uh, will just remove air from the water. So the limit is 0.7 bar. So if there is a foul end, we can uh, not uh, apply higher vacuum than minus 0.7 bar. So in most cases, we don't need such a high vacuum, not in the temperature like Singapore and California, but in the places where you have low temperature in the Northern Europe, then that could be a problem. There may be not enough uh, TMP to produce uh, sufficient filtrate flux. Okay, the, on the other hand, the, the pressure driven have a small footprint, footprint this requires larger footprint, require basin here, just slap and we can train. So this is more cost effective, the immerse in the large system, it required larger volume of cleaning solution. On the other hand, can retrofit gravity filters. So have basin of gravity filter basin, you could remove the sand, make some modification and uh, load the uh, immerse uh, um, uh, membrane, uh, capillary membranes. So the pressure driven, it's, it's so this indirect flow, it's 100% it's, uh, recovery, all the filtrate is pushed through the, through the membrane and the, foul, the colloids uh, stick to the membrane, creates fouling layer. Okay, then uh, for the backwash, we reverse the flow and we apply the flow, filtrate flow in reverse direction, flushing the, the foulant out of the membrane. And uh, again, in this case, the pressure, everything operates at low pressure. All the operation, it's a low pressure operation, seldom exceeding two bar, okay? Now, a, a, this backwash, so the normal operation is between 20 to 40 minutes, normal filtration step, and then by backwash, which lasts anywhere between 30 to 60 seconds. Now, from time to time, we add to the backwash uh, hypochloride, which is it's called chemical enhanced backwash, and this to break the organics, which cannot be removed otherwise. 
And this chemical enhanced backwash, we could add every backwash, but usually that every four backwash or ten backwash. Okay, so the backwash we're doing uh, first of all allow water to go from the top and then allow water to go from the bottom and uh, uh, and then go to the crossroads. So the, this using allow water to leave only from the top, only from the bottom is to improve the backwash because the capillary the lens is one meter over one meter. So if we, so usually the effectiveness comes from the close to the port which allows water to escape and the other part is not so well backwash. So we have to reverse this and close here, open here, and this way we're getting better, uh, more effective backwash. And then we're doing cross flow, letting the, just a, a feed water flash also for the short fight, very short time to sweep the foulant from the membrane surface. Now the clinic process is done every one to two months. The, of course, depends on the condition of the membrane and the feed water quality. And this is like it, the, so the backwash, it's always done from the direction of the filtry. The cleaning is always done from the side of the feed water. And the cleaning uh, contains sodium hypochlorite and high concentration, sodium hydroxide, organic acid like citric acid, sometimes phosphoric acid. Orga the citric acid is very expensive, so we try to substitute this with, with nitric acid or phosphoric acid. So the operation uh, in the pressure-driven uh, technology, we have the operation cycle, which is filtration, forward flush, backwash, chemical enhanced backwash, using of air only from the outside in, for the outside in technology, and cleaning in place, cleaning in place CIP. So the length of the operation cycle is based on the either uh, uh, historical data, but uh, it could be based on filtrate uh, volume, operating time, increase of TMP, uh, uh, volume and TMP increase. In normal operation, it's only based on time. We set up time, let's say every 30 minutes, and system operates every 30 minutes. Now, if before 30 minutes, the, we're reaching the maximum pressure, which we set up the maximum feed pressure to produce the, the required quality of the filtrate, then we have to adjust the whole system. So we have to find out why is this, uh, uh, the filtration cycle shorter than design? Because system is designed, capacity is based on the filtration cycle. And this, then the membrane filtration, like media filters in a row, operate at constant flux rate. We, we, we have a constant production of the filtrate. So duration for the filtrate 20 to 60 minutes and the flux rate could be anywhere from 30 to 120 LMH with concentrate valve closed. So dead end filtration. So it's obvious that immediately at the start, the membrane is covered with the foulant and this resistance to flow goes up and we have to increase the feed pressure or reduce permit pressure. Okay, so this is the feed, the concentrate valve is closed and producing filtrate. So intermittent forward flush is like sweeping operation that we open for the very short period of time, uh, 10, 20 seconds and let the water flush at the high velocity. So here, because it's it, the tubes, capillary and the velocity could be high, it's not like RO where the cleaning did not remove uh, particles here, the cleaning, uh, the flashing can remove particles. Okay, so this is flash forward. Backwash, this is the starting from the, uh, reversing the flow of the filtrate. So 20 to 60 minutes, duration 20 to 60 seconds. Flux rate two to four times flux in direct filtration, content rate valve open. Okay, so we have the chemical enhanced, enhanced backwash, could be CAB1, CAB2, and three. 
CAB1, it's usually hypochlorite. CAB2 and 3 would be high and low pH. And while this is done very frequently, is let's say every fourth or fifth, CAB2, CAB3, maybe once a day. And, but all those, all CABs, it means that the chemicals is it's add to the filtrate flowing in the reverse direction. CIP, it's, it, it we add chemicals on the feed side of the, of the membrane. Okay, so the filtrate, the backwash, bottom, backwash, top. Okay, so those are the valves. So this is the, during the direct filtration, feed, all the concentrate valve is closed, bypass valve is closed, only the filtrate valve is open and goes to the, to the backwash tank and to the filtrate. Now I'm backwash top, now we, we, we close the feed valve, this valve is closed, this valve is open, backwash pump operates and backwashes. Bottom, the same operation, but now we open this valve. This one close, open this valve. The bypass valve, and this allows uh, on the other end uh, uh, water to go out to drain. During the CIB, uh, CIB and again, we have the with this is the backwash flow and add chemicals to the filtrate flowing in the backwash mode. <coughs> uh, during the draining, we, we, we just uh, allow the, uh, uh, open the filtrate and allow the water to drain, okay? and uh, we're supplying air. We're applying air here, and then fill the element with air, which force the water to drain from the, from the element. And then for the, we pressurize, okay? This is for the, during the, during the, sorry, during the integrity test, okay? Direct filtration again, this is the, the, I, the uh, configuration already of the unit. So we have the, we have the raw water tank, feed pump, adding the chemicals for the cleaning if necessary, pre-filter. It's very important the all membrane filtration unit have to have pre-filter. The rating is usually, sorry, the rating is usually 100 micron. And this is to prevent block, uh, prevent blockage of the, of the, capillaries or accumulation of the large particles into shell. So every, uh, the rating of the, rating of the pre-filter is specified by the membrane manufacturer, but usually it's 100 micron or close to this range. Except for the, for the systems like flat sheet uh, membrane filtration and uh, this for the pressurize, for the capillary, for the, Outside in immerse, there is the requirements are much, uh, you can have much larger opening of the, of the pre-filter. Uh, usually it could be like 0.1 millimeter even, so thousand micro. Uh, so we have this pre-filter and the, the membrane unit and this produces a treated uh, wall, uh, back, uh, fills backwash, tank and the large tank of the treated water. Here you have the backwash pump for the chemical one, chemical two, air compression for the air scouring. Now to, to, to do backwash with the air scouring, we apply air compressor and also the backwash pump at the same time. So this is just very, we have bubble which scouring the, the, the membrane and this and on the outside and there to remove foulon, creating the vibration or remove foulon. Okay, the, this is another type of the, another manufacturer and this shows the air, 
water inlet and air inlet. Okay, so this is air, uh, water, and air getting to the cap to the between the capillaries and uh, air scouring the membrane. So this is the air scouring produced uh, by the air bubble. So typical air scouring duration, stop filtration, air scouring 60 to 120 seconds, uh, air scouring to drain, refill, resume filtration. Okay, so those are the air scouring mode that shows the valves, which valve is open, which valve is closed. So we have if we producing the stop filtration, so we'll uh, stop the valves. Okay, and now the air scouring. Uh, uh, Okay, so concentrate air scouring. We open the air scouring valve and the, uh, in this case with 12 to 15 cubic meter per hour per module, pressure 0 0.7 bar. Okay. All right. To drain. We're forcing the water by air to drain, closing everything except the drain, and then uh, resume filtration. Oh, I don't know. Refill and resume filtration. What is this? Okay. So in addition the, to air scouring, there is CIP, main, it's usually called maintenance uh, cleaning. And it's, uh, it includes the air scouring, in addition, chemical dosing and soak. In this case, soak is 10 minutes. And again, the uh, air scouring and, and pressurized to drain, refill, total of 27 minutes. So this is relatively large uh, amount of time. You, you will see that those, those cleaning operations take significant amount of uh, time. And here we have different uh, uh, maintenance cleaning. Uh, maintenance cleaning one, 200 PP, ppm uh, chlor chlorine, and a maintenance to sodium hydroxide, maintenance three sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid, and maintenance one and two, which is chlorine plus sodium hydroxide. Okay, so we'll not, I will not spend too much time if you, you can uh, just say it, uh, but it's actually uh, the, the only issue is that we apply this from the time in this uh, operation. Uh, it takes long time and uh, uh, and it's done not very frequently. It's done maybe once uh, every few weeks, but still requires a lot of time. And also during the time, this the the membrane does the system does not train does not produce filtrate. Okay, this is the PNID of the of the membrane filtration unit. This is the membrane filtration unit, and this is the strainer. And here you have the permeate tank for the back, for the collection of the permeate, but also for the backwash, and all the chemicals for the CAB and MC and maintenance cleaning are here. And uh, uh, sorry, no strain is not here. Here is the, comp the air compressor. Here is the, the feed tank and the strainers are here. So feed tank strainers go to the membrane unit and here the chemical storage and chemical dosing tank and permit. Now the, the membrane filtration, as I said, produce water without colloid, colloidal matter, but only under condition that the membrane have good integrity. For the potable application, you obligated by regulation that the system, I mean, not you, but the system operator is obligated by regulation to test integrity of the system daily. And there could be different uh, methods of testing integrity. The most common is pressure decay. 
So the system is drained of the water by applying air pressure, clean air pressure. Then the system, it's all the valves are closed, system is pressurized for five minutes and the rate of the pressure drop indicates the integrity. The integrity is calculated by the by the PLC. So software calculates integrity. You have to remember there is some diffusion out of the air because just membrane are no hundred percent will will reject the air. There's some passage of the air through the membrane. So, but the uh, this is some, but anything above the calculated rate of the air diffusion indicates problem with integrity and according to the regulation can be done daily if the, if the, for the potable water system. If there is integrity problem, system has to stop, has to be stopped and the uh, module which has a problem has to be re uh, removed and either uh, leak plug or element replaced. Okay, so step one, the, the, the system is filled with water, drained from the feed site. There is uh, when they apply air pressure uh, and the step three, and step four, the, and we measure the air pressure uh, and then we uh, uh, apply air, the liquid is displaced. And then uh, in the end of the integrity test, the air is replaced by the, by the feed water. Okay, so we have a, we close the, the feed uh, and we apply air pressure then about 15 PSI, it's one bar, one bar feed pressure and the, uh, and the, uh, the, all the, uh, the, the water is this, the go to drain and then we close both uh, valves and wait uh, 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 five minutes. And, and uh, so this is the zero two, to zero zero two to zero zero three bar the de uh, decline is per diffusion. Anything above indicates problem of integrity. So also the 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 elements, most of the elements have the, on the filtrate, they have a clear, clear PVC segment, which allows if there is the air bubbles, it can immediately be seen. Okay, this is just integrity testing. We'll not go through this again, but this shows the, the, the segment of the clear PVC segment in the air bubble. So I mean, this module, it's defective. Now, this is, so, so then the module has to be taken out of operation. Then you have to find the fiber, which has a problem and plug both ends of the fiber. You have to remember that the system could have uh, 10,000 fibers. So it's not easy task. The, the module, it's long. It's about one and a half meter. It's heavy. Those, this uh, finding the fiber and correcting is difficult operation. Therefore, usually the membrane manufacturer have to make warranty, provide warranty. How many breakage they, they will be allowed before they have to replace the element, element to element. So it usually this is just one or two per year, per, per, per module, because it's very disruptive to take the elements out in this case, you have a valve, so you can isolate it, but some system don't have valves, so you have to stop the whole train. You have to first find the, the module, leaking module, and you have to stop the whole train, and so on and so on. This is the serious problem in potable water system. In wastewater reclamation, it's a smaller problem. You still, you don't want massive fiber breakage, but one, two fiber, broken fiber is not a big deal. It's also being plugged very fast by the Fowland and the seawater is also similar, but still there. Are, so in the, the, in the potable system, as I said, it has to be tested daily. Now the, the, the integrity test, uh, test takes about 20 to 30 minutes. So this is also has to be count when the calculating the how much capacity you need from the system. Uh, 
is on the wastewater reclamation and uh, uh, seawater sometimes have to do daily, but usually they do maybe once per week. Okay, and the, this is pressure-driven capillary unit, that again, oxidant, coagulant, which is hypochlorite, or coagulant, ferric, if required, strainer, uh, and then the module, which the train, which represents the module, filtrate goes to the storage tank, it's also it's used for the backwash, CIB, CIB1, CIB2, CIB3, overflow goes to the filtrate, and okay. So this is the one of the examples of the strainer. This one is by Arkal, I think, Amiad or Arkal. And uh, okay, so this is, this is the disc strainer. So there are a number of discs creating gaps of 100 micron. And when the pressure drop reaches the critical volume, there's a springs, open all the discs is flushed out and the discs are closed again, okay? So pressure-driven capillary uh, system, those are the sequence of operation, forward flow, 15 to 16 minutes, backwash, chemical enhanced backwash, cleaning in place, integrity test. So just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that only this step produces water, only this one. All the other steps either uses water for the backwash or do not produce water. So this is, so when you do the, the size, when we do the sizing of the membrane filtration unit, we have to take into consideration the fact that only fraction of the time, the system will produce water and the other times either will not produce water or will not produce water and not even use the, the filtrate, okay? So let's see, we have the design flux uh, 85 LMH and backwash 300 every 30 minutes, duration one minute, off time 1.5 minutes, but half a minute for the opening closing the valves, integrity test once a day, 20 minutes, CB 10 minutes. So now total off time. So, per minute, so it's uh, uh, so we have uh, one uh, for uh, 1440, this is minute in day, minus 20 minutes integrity, minus uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, CIB, and this happens uh, every 31 and five minutes. So this is uh, 67 uh, minutes, okay? And uh, what is the another 30 minutes? Okay, so this is 67 minutes it, times 1.5. This is how of, uh, offline time during to the backwash. Backwash, it, it takes 1.5 minutes. This is how many how uh, this is 67 uh, minutes and plus uh, 20 plus 10 plus 30 minutes for the 20 for integrity, 20 for the CIB. So altogether 97 minutes out of 1440, the system is, does not produce water. Okay, uh, so the, so we have a, uh, 45, which is 45. Okay, so 45 is the membrane area of the elements, time 300, the, the backwash, a time uh, divided by, a, by water produced by the system, 85, a, a, uh, 85 LMS, this is normal filtration flux, which happened uh, 1440 minus 97, okay? So we, the filtrate capacity required for backwash, we need 11%, 11.8%. And compensate for the offline uh, time, it's 97 divided 1440 minus 7.2. 
time for membrane cleaning 1% and country capacity uh, 5%. So all together with total additional capacity of the system 25%. So if we design system for the, I don't know, 37,850, we need to add 125, okay? So now we, we divided this by how much membrane is required. It's a, a, it's a, this is the membrane air, this is the membrane area divided by 46 membrane modules. So we need five of four, five of four elements. So we will have a, if we have 48 modules per rack, we'll have 11 racks. Now in the, in the membrane filtration system, as you already know, we have this unit in operation, unit in backwards. So always at least one unit will be in back. You can assume that at least one unit has to be backwards. So usually we have, we have to have number of uh, uh, train required plus one, but there's also time when the some train could be, be in maintenance. There are a number of valves. It's not like a row that we start the RO unit and train operates continuously. Here, every, there is stop every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, every 40 minutes. Those valves uh, have required much frequent maintenance than in the RO. Therefore, minimum we need always N plus two. This is the minimum number of units we need uh, for the membrane filtration. So what are the components of operating cost of the membrane filtration, power, chemicals, labor, maintenance, membrane replacement. Now for the power, we taking every pump, we have her efficiency, what pressure will operate, what flow and, and how much time it will be active, what percentage of time will be active. For example, feed, feed pump will be only active during the production of the filtrate or during the, the flushing, okay? So it will be 92%, backwash pump, 37%, cleaning pump, 6.1%, and cleaning and heater, 8%, 8 compressor, 12%, valve actuators, and PLC. So total, and calculated the power, and total is 173.7 kilowatt. And then our chemicals, we have a dosage, we have kilogram per day, which are usually provided by the membrane manufacturer. And then we have the cost per day for CIP, for CIBs and CIPs. So now power, it's a, at the 10 cents per kilowatt, per kilowatt hours is this number of a dollar per day. This is per cubic meter, chemicals is similar range. Operating cost, operating cost, as you can see, it's very high. It's, so this is for this system. If we have a number of operators could be lower than this, then our system is much significantly larger, this will be lower. So we have 0051, but almost half of it is the labor. So if the labor could be reduced, the cost could go down. Okay, so vacuum driven now we have vacuum on the on the vacuum on the lumen side or vacuum between the sheets of the membrane. And operating cycle is the same with one addition, filtration. Now in the in the pressure driven technology, we had the draining of the element. Here we have the tank the tank tank the concentration. Because once we do the backwash, all the all sorry, all the foulants are collected in tank. We have to drain the tank to remove the foulant. Otherwise, they will accumulate there and will eventually prevent the normal operation. We have air scouring, chemical enhanced backwash, maintenance cleaning, cleaning in place. So all these steps are the same as the pressure driven, except for tank the uh, tank the concentration draining of the tank.
Okay, so this is schematic of the immerse, submersible. You have again strainer, but this strainer could be much uh, larger opening. And CIP1, CIP2, air blower, because we have here almost continuous uh, air blowering. And uh, uh, then we have filtrate, vacuum pump, filtrate and uh, backwash pump, CAB1, CAB2, CAB3. So duration, we can assume are the same with the backwash and tank the concentration and chemicals and hand backwash, uh, cleaning in place, integrity test. So now we have the design, as you can see, the filtrate flag, design filtrate flag is much lower because we limited how much uh, vacuum we can apply. Backwash is uh, 82 and all this time. And again, we have the total of uh, line time per day is 97 minutes. Okay. So again, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, Backwash flux, so the, the filtrate required by backwash divided by, by filtrate producing. We have 10.6% uh, uh, of the filtrate using by backwash. For the offline time, it's 7.2. Time required, also 5% contingency. So now, all together, we have a, a so we will need 24%. So practically it's the same as the pressure driven. We need an additional uh, 24, 25% of capacity for the system, for the nominal capacity. So in this case, we'll have a, a 300 uh, modules and number of, we'll make number of blocks 10. Again, like in the pressure driven, we'll have N plus two for the, for the system. And the, Components operating costs are the same as in the pressure driven. So again, we calculate the energy. Energy comes a little lower because we operate at lower pressure, lower vacuum pressure. And the chemicals also little less chemicals than previously, but uh, it very much depends on the on the provider. But nevertheless. Okay, so previously you have uh, zero five cents, here you have four cents. Again, the labor is the 50%, here even higher than 50% of the cost of the, of the water cost. So it depends on the number of personnel, this cost could be reduced. Okay, so if we compare the pressure driven, vacuum driven strainer, 100, 150, 0.5 to 2 millimeter feed pumps, here vacuum pumps, vacuum receiver. What is vacuum receiver? Vacuum receiver is a big tank which collects the air which we it's being released when we apply vacuum to the feed water and from, and, and from time to time has to be removed by the pump. Otherwise, the line will be blocked with air and the system will stop operation. We have UF trains, MF trains, MF tanks. If you have a tanks, you have just slab and on slab the, the are trains, the uh, fra train frames, backwash pumps, backwash pumps, filtrate storage, everything the same. Uh, so this is uh, air blower cleaning system, cleaning tanks, has to be done in the tanks. Instrumentation, everything is the same. So the only difference is that the uh, immersed system using the vacuum pumps, vacuum receiver, and the, the membrane are in tanks rather than being an encapsulated module in train. So this is just if you would like to replace the gravity filters with the membrane filtration, you could have a, you need much lower a, a number of the, of the filters to get the same capacity, it depends on the flux rate the ratio ranging from 1.4 to 3.6 the, in the advantage of the membrane filtration. This has not been done very frequently, but some places it, uh, the, membrane, the media filtration was replaced with membrane filtration. 
Okay, what are the commercial products of the membrane filtration? So we have a, a Aquasource, have a, its French company, have its a cellulose acetate, modified polysulfon. The cellulose acetate modules are the modules with the largest membrane area in the market. They are very good membrane, hydro, permanently hydrophilic. The only problem is that for the cleaning, there is, cannot be cleaned at high pH and exposure to the high concentration of chlorine can also damage the membrane. So though they are good membrane, they are not that commonly accepted outside France. Koch membrane, another little, it's not the major player, the membrane made of polysulfon. Inge, it's a company which is relatively, today it's not a new company, but it came to the market much later than the other major player, but came with the excellent product, product made of modified polysulfon. It's multibore. Multibore, it's when the, all the membranes struggle to get in, maintain integrity. Inge, because of the multibore configuration, there was membrane which didn't break, okay? And uh, I will show you this. Okay, this is the multibore. So rather than normal capillary have just one, they have here uh, seven bores, so the capillary thicker, and it's very strong. Because of this, it's very strong and does not break. And this was very big advantage, which allows them to good market penetration. Today, it's one of the major players. Uh, it's not called Inge anymore. It's, I think it's owned by BSF or someone else. In the membrane markets, the owners are changing uh, rather frequently. So there also came with the concept, when the other people came with the concept of the racks, which you build racks and put the, put the elements there, connect with the tubing, they come with integrated racks, integrated header which forms the racks. So this is the steps, fiber, module, a rack, and then you have a treatment plant. Let's see how it works. So this is the racks which the, the module comes already with the connecting uh, parts. And then you only add the, the connectors and the, and the headers. It's very smart design, very good design and this also helps standardize the configuration. Okay, so this is the Sam Municipal plant in China, in the, I believe. And you can see those uh, modules with the headers form the common header. And this is the distribution uh, or collection. I don't know which one is collection or distribution but uh, the uh, rack for the feed and for the filtrate. So very, and this all of course reduces cost uh, rather than having metal frame here, and that's the membrane by element by itself form a frame. Okay, so this is China, this is just some, uh, uh, it, so we have the biological wastewater, uh, which is, uh, activated sludge, I believe, coagulant, DAF, uh, dual media, strainer, UF, and RO. This is the specification of the element. Okay, Polasahi. Polasahi is one of the older players in the market. Pol, it's actually the company which makes the systems. And the Asahi is company that provides the membrane elements. Paul, it's US, Sasaki is a Japanese company. The membrane Mikroza was a, a very well accepted on the market uh, from the very beginning, mainly because one of the big reasons was that the fibers were very strong, practically didn't break. Not as strong as Inge, but still very good uh, durability. And this is outside in operation. Inga is inside out. And this is outside in operation with air scouring. Okay, so this is, you have the feet and air is coming. Uh, and uh, this is potting material. <coughs> and the air, it's also provided in the bottom. And the retrain configuration is similar in the sense to to Inge, but it's 
still it's a little, okay. Okay, so this is uh, submerged elements. This is how this looked like. You have a tank, air scouring, fill the tank uh, with, the, with the screen, half to a few millimeters, a vacuum pump takes filtrate water, and some of the filtrate water go to the backwash tank, backwash pump. This is a German company, uh, Liquiflux. Uh, it's made of, I believe, polysulfon membrane. Uh, this is how the, the membrane frame looks like. This is hydronautics. You see, this is still the old approach, making all the metal parts and the metal piping. The Inga approach, it's much more cost effective than this one. You see how much metal is here. It's tremendously expensive. Okay, Norit is the one of the early uh, manufacturer of ultrafiltration membrane. The membrane is sulfonated uh, uh, polysulfon. Their membrane came, utilized the, the RO pressure vessel, okay? So the membrane are connected in each to each other. And there are, I think, four or five elements per vessel. So this is how it looks like. And they are horizontal. Now the order to allow feed water to reach other elements without subsequent, they have this passage channels in each element, which allows feed water to go and to apply the same pressure along the, uh, the pressure vessel, which is very important. This is the plant in Eagle Pass, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, even in Texas, US Texas, Texas, US. And nothing special, but uh, using the, the same pressure vessel as a row, and this way they penetrate the market as a lower cost alternative. Memcor, this is the, actually the first modern membrane filtration company. Initially, they came from polyethylene, polypropylene membrane. Well, and today, they're using uh, PVDF. Those are the membrane. They have very good membrane. They own by, I don't know who owns them today, uh, but uh, don't remember. The change, uh, uh, vo there was a VOQUA last week, it was US filters and a VOQUA. I'm not sure if they still have VOQUA. Anyway, they have a good membrane used uh, frequently in the potable application and wastewater application. Oh, so the member is DuPont now, sorry. Okay, so they have, uh, they have both pressure driven and, uh, and uh, vacuum driven outside in operation. So they have this uh, uh, pressure driven and here you have immersed vacuum driven. This is the pressure driven memcore uh, membrane modules, uh, membrane train, and this is vacuum driven wastewater. Okay, so how, what is the control philosophy? You have, the, you have the tank, you have the membrane here, this is the process air. This is the air for the, for the air scouring, backwash recycling, CIP, which is done in the tank from the outside. The filtrate water goes uh, here. And this is the raw water feed through the channel, like, the, like media filtration. This is for the air scouring. So the, in the, Membrane filtration as in, in differentiating to the RO, there is still very little standardization. So every membrane manufacturer have a different configuration. Therefore, the, the membrane cannot be replaced from one manufacturer to another. I mean, they can, but then you have to change the train completely. Frequently, you have to change the pumps because there's different flow rates, both for the feed, backwash, and air scouring. Okay, so that just, uh, this is the pressure driven, this is the vacuum driven. So you can see this is the limit 85 kilopascal, but usually it has to be lower. I mean, the limit is usually 70 is the maximum. It also depends on the water temperature. 
So this is in the shell, this is an open tank. Uh, uh, this, uh, the backwash is explosive airflow, fiber, here is fiber, uh, vibration. Integrity, pressure decay test, and cleaning in place similar, and power usage. This one uses less than pressure driven, mainly because it operates at lower pressure, operates at lower flux. Okay, so this is the track. This is another manufacturer. This one, I believe, is DuPont, who was Dow, and has it outside in, has membrane area 102 square meter, which is large membrane area. The length is a 2.4 meter, so very long element. So for this reason, if you do the backwash, they have to do backwash half and let the water go this end and ha the other half water go this end. Those are the trains, again, this, the old fashioned configuration with the frames and, uh, and the frames rather than like ink or other trying to, I think eventually everyone will have this integrated header and will be self-supporting trains. This is, uh, I believe hydronautics maybe. Yes, hydrocap. Okay, so this is a, a made of PVDF. The advantage of this membrane is that they do not use water for backwash. Actually do not use water backwash, use only air scouring. They're using some water for flushing, but otherwise they're only using air scouring there their recovery rate, utilization of the feed water is very high, could be as high as 96%. Other membrane usually have 92%, 90 to 92%. So this is big advantage in the system where there's limitation on disposal of the wastewater. So they say that we're not using uh, filtrate for the backwash, only using the back, uh, filtrate for cleaning CIP or maintenance cleaning, otherwise we're using air scouring. Xenon, one of the oldest the manufacturer, mainly for the, for the MBR, but later on also for membrane filtration. And this is outside in, and there is a made of the, also I think PVDF, and this is for the low solid concentration. So it is like type of cassette and for the, the cassette form trains, which are in the tank, this is the feed water supply. Uh, those are the fibers are used mainly for the MBR. Those are uh, uh, very strong fibers, they are supported. So then uh, everything else was self-supported. Those fibers have the uh, polyester uh, insert, which and all on top of it, we have the membrane, the membrane is PVDF. Okay, so majority of the membrane manufacturer, they still have this old name. So you have to forgive me, I have not updated for the now current owners. But you can see that the membrane type could be either MF or UF, and membrane material could be mainly C cellulose acetate for aqua source, PVDF, polytersulfon, polysulfon. PVDF, PVDF. So PVDF looks like is leading membrane, the most common membrane for the polymer, for the membrane filtration. Now this is model uh, configuration, pressure driven inside out, pressure driven outside in, or submersible. So I can see the majority here, it's pressure driven outside in. So this has been, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons we're using air scouring. And the other reason is that uh, this, for the same uh, quantity of polymer, we're getting twice membrane area. So the system also can produce more water. So this is the big advantage. So the future of the technology, uh, I think, well, is, is driven, in, driven in, driving into pressure driven outside in. Those are the, the approval of the, of the virus Giardii cryptosporidium log, log, log removal. 
So lock removal, it's mean, let's say four lock removals, so meaning defeat if you have, if there is a 10,000 uh, per centimeter, the 10, 10 to four uh, concentration of, uh, of cryptosporodium, the filtrate will have only one, less than one, okay? This will be four log removal. Now those are the, even though the membrane can remove more than, have higher than four log removal, the approval is just only four log the maximum. For the, for the UF it's uh, uh, across the board, for the, for the, MF, the virus is only 0.5, but everything else could be four. What interesting is that the co contact clarifier has no membrane, no separation sur surface, has a one a lock a credit for virus and two lock for Jadia cryptosporum, the same media filtration. What is interesting that the RO has zero. And the, 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 there is no credit for the RO for the, for the removal virus, Jardia, cryptosporodium. And this is because the, the health authorities claim you cannot test integrity of the RO, which is true. You cannot test daily. You cannot test when the RO is in the system. So there was a was number of efforts made to, to develop methods for testing integrity of RO. And one of the methods was using the tracer, which will be add to scale inhibitor. So then you can see if it's in the, in the permeate, so there is a loss of integrity. The problem is it's quite expensive. So for now, there is no, there is no uh, integrity test for the RO and for the reason they're not getting credit. Okay, so ceramic membranes. Ceramic membranes come in a variety of configuration. The variety is much bigger than for the polymeric membrane because they are newer membrane, newer uh, uh, comer to the system, though they have a lot of advantage. And one big disadvantage is cost, of course, but they have a lot of advantage because they has, has the high, uh, permanently hydrophilic, they mechanically strong, and they can be treat with any harsh chemical, the li not limited by temperature. But on the other hand, they are microfiltration, not ultrafiltration. And the cost is going down. So in the future, we'll see more and more uh, ceramic membranes uh, entering the market. Let's see, we have some. Okay, so this is one example. is a membrane. So this is, I think, German company, they have this plates and they, put, they insert the plate, the plate can be stuck okay, as this, and can, but of course has to be put into, into some, some tank, some uh, uh, raw water tank. Then can operate at very high fluxes. The fluxes could be 200 LMH, 300 LMH with very good results. However, they require coagulant. Without coagulant, their performance are not good. So the places where you do need coagulant, you can use them, operate at very high flux, and then their, their economic uh, incentive uh, become much higher. So they can, they can be competitive with the polymeric membrane. So this is something which has to be kept in mind for the future. So as I said, permanent hydrophilic, very high flux, can be preserved in dry condition. They do not uh, lose performance in dry condition. Clean, sanitize, long useful, uh, long, uh, long useful membrane life. But again, lack of standardization, mechanical strong by brittle, high cost of membrane. So this is some example of the cost for the comparison of the cost polymeric versus ceramic, but some caution was submitted by the manufacturer of ceramic membrane. So they showing that the 20 years present wars, you already know what the present wars is, total, it's very similar, okay? But the pretreatment of the present wars, it's much lower, okay? Because they have lower uh, 
lower uh, uh, annual operating cost. Capital cost is high, so in the end, I'm not sure, I think that the, they got the project. It wasn't a big project, uh, <clears throat> but I think they got it. There are more and more membrane installation using ceramic membranes coming in. Uh, okay. So I finished a little earlier. So let's now maybe discuss the, okay, first of all, question. And then we go through the, through the uh, chat. Okay, let's me go Can you see the, the chat, Mark? Yeah, let me see. I want to see the chat. Chat. Okay, I don't see, don't see the chat. Let me see how it was that I've seen the chat last time. <laughs> Uh, you want me to read the question? Oh, yeah, just saying, stop. Oh, yeah, that was chat. Okay. Long group chat. I think that I have. Okay, so I see the chat. Uh, what brings the second information? Fancy names that think as well. Think about it. Okay, so the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 I think we have here a representative of. Uh, of Genesis, yes? It's, uh, who is this uh, from Genesis? Could you unmute everyone, please, for a minute? Yeah, sure. On your, on your Jonathan hand. So J, okay. Yes. Jonathan? Jonathan? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so, okay, so you probably can comment on this, no? Um, well, maybe it's, a, it's a, maybe a slightly biased comment coming from a chemical supplier. Um, but we would always say that formulated products outperform commodity type products for membrane cleaning, whether it be on ultrafiltration or nanofiltration or RO installations. What we see is that commodity products generally will only elevate or suppress the pH. They don't have any saponification or detergent activity to assist in removing foulant. So where you might find that some people start to formulate their own products by including of some form of detergent, uh, sodium lauryl sulfate or any other surfactant type material, we've already pre-formulated that material so that it, it, it buffers within the right pH range, the surfactants are in the right uh, ratios, and that you get a more enhanced cleaning effect with a a specialized or a, a proprietary branded product in comparison to a commodity product. Okay, what about the disinfectants? So disinfection again is, uh, they are generally, if you talk about non-oxidizers, uh, DBMPA, isothiazidin, they are commodity car products. Um, yes, there's, there's not much scope in terms of um, performance or speciality products in, in that sort of sphere of the, the, the CRP chemicals. Um, and it's not an area that as Genesis, we really spend a lot of time uh, developing products or looking at. We're really interested in the CRP part that where you're looking to remove the foul and trying to lift the foul and off the surface of the membrane. The way you were talking earlier today about um, doing, using osmotic pressure, uh, part of or one of the range of Genesis products have 
a component that changes the, the osmotic pressure in the membrane so that when you come to soak the membranes in the cleaning process, you actually have that deposit starting to be lifted off the surface of the membrane under normal forward osmosis. Okay, Jonathan, 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 Jonathan. make use of multiple technologies to help the operator clean the membrane. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so now my comments to this. I think that would the, the prudent approach for the operator of the arrow plant is to have a single element test unit, which has a cleaning unit. Those are units are very inexpensive. You can build one for a few thousand dollars and then take the elements from the fouled elements from the system and in, and use the formulated chemicals, use the standard chemicals and see the, the results. Because the problem is when you send the elements to the supplier of the chemicals, because of the transportation time, the foulant changes. It's not the same, the same consistency, not the same structure or condition when you have, when you take this from the elements or from the system or when it's on the system. So the prudent approach is to have the single elements cleaning unit, single elements test units, which I show you. And it's, I believe me, I did it a number of times. It's just a few thousand dollars. You can build it in no time. And, uh, and then you can get, uh, then you can check and see there will be location where generic chemicals will work very well. And there are a location that maybe it's uh, formulation, uh, formulated chemicals will look better. So this is the, the right approach. Okay. It is next question. It's possible to recommend a possible piping design software for our system. Uh, no, I don't know specific piping design software, but there are different CAD software, 3D CAD software, which allows you to see the piping alignment, the piping alignment, which will, which will not, uh, uh, which will, which will not uh, be in conflict or create some uh, problems. In principle, the the piping uh, uh, design should follow the good engineering practice, which is the maximum flow to prevent erosion of the material. And this is something which is mechanical engineering, it's not related to the RO. One thing which I should mention here with all the piping alignments, you should uh, develop the hydraulic profile. And hydraulic profile should be such to minimize pumping. So you have the, let's say, for example, it's the same for any system, brackish seawater, wastewater application, you try to reduce number of pumps, you try to reduce number of, of pumping steps. Each pumping step adds inefficiency, adds both energy consumption, but also inefficiency in the process, so increases the energy requirements. For example, if you, let's say you have seawater system and you have a clarifier or DAF, which I do not recommend, but let's say you do, the next step should be the gravity filter, not the pressure filter, because the water should flow from the, this clarify, clarifier or DAF to the gravity filter without repumping. Only then from the clear well of the, of the, of the media filtration, you will pump. So this is the, those principle not to exceed the, the limited uh, flow velocity that means as fast as diameter and keep the hydraulic profile to reduce pumping. Okay, it's a recommend to use 40 PVC in piping system. Well, it depends on the size. I, I think you have a table. I think it was uh, module two, which shows you in each case, you can use 40, uh, schedule 40. Uh, you, you should use uh, such a piping that uh, PVC, I would recommend use mainly in the inside because otherwise we have to use PVC, which has a, 
which has a, its UV its UV protection component. Otherwise, it will be it will be damaged very fast. Okay. Uh, the, if there are no other questions, let me just go for the moment. Okay, to the just let me open the Excel. Okay. Okay, so let me just go again to Zoom. If we go to screen share, we go. Uh, Tony, is possible to see the my screen? Yes. Yes. You're sharing now the the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. So someone asked me about the. Uh, okay. Let's see. About the P acid dosing for. Uh, pH adjustment in seawater. This is, by the way, the quantity of acid which I was using in calculation. One of the pretreatment uh, pretreatment uh, exercise. So this is seawater. This is feed water. And uh, as we're changing pH. Well, let's see. As we're changing pH, what changes is the alkalinity is changed. Okay, so all the equations which are not here, but we've done in the previous, let's say, uh, uh, this based on the changes of alkalinity. So the acid dosage, it's the changes of alkalinity times the, I don't know why it comes, 49,000, 49,000. Okay, uh, so this is the, this, the sulfuric acid doesn't the change for alkalinity, the molar change of alkalinity times molecular weight of the equivalent of the acid. And the dosing liter per hour is just uh, based on the, on the dosing rate B22 and B, okay, so let's go based on the, on the flow rate, the concentration and acid density. Okay, I want to go here maybe, let me see. Okay, and all the calculation are based on this relation, relation between the, uh, alkalinity and total inorganic carbon, which I mentioned, I believe in the second module and their relation. So from this relation, having two value like pH and bicarbonate, you can calculate the CO2 and then you can calculate the everything else. So this is, uh, you can follow the, the calculation. Now, let me see the, the exercise, pretreatment sizing. Okay, pretreatment sizing exercise. So this is the exercise which we were, uh, which we were given in days based on the 250,000 cubic meter per day seawater system recovery rate uh, 40%, and uh, uh, using gravity filtration, and we have the height of the of the all the levels. And uh, as you can see, the required acid dosing is taken from the from the from the spreadsheet where you have the acid dosing calculation, and the and this is also the pretreat the the flow rate with pretreatment sizing. So I'm using the other. You can follow up using the other uh, the other spreadsheet. 
And if you have any question, let me know and tomorrow we can discuss this. Okay, I would like to ask you, okay, let's see, don't say those. Okay, uh, okay. So not say the, uh, let me see. Okay. So uh, can you unmute everyone? It's possible, Tony? Yes, I'll try. Because, uh, it should be if this is one button. If this is complicated, we'll, we'll do it next time. No, because for some participants, I have to ask them to unmute. Oh, I see. Themselves. Okay, so oh, okay, so leave it this way. Uh, I have. Okay, they are mm -hmm. now getting unmute. Okay, uh, not on. So uh, okay, if you have uh, not all everyone, so let's leave it for the next time. No, 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 Tony, mute, mute them again. I think this won't work. No, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, that okay. won't work. No, won't work. No, that won't work. That's, <laughs> I, I, my mistake. Okay. Okay. So I would just say, uh, uh, I would just ask you for, for the last session tomorrow. Okay. Please review the spreadsheet. If you have any question, I will respond. Also, if there's any subject. In addition, what is listed for tomorrow, you want me to discuss, let me know. Of course, from the area of the, of the membrane filtration or the salination, I will be glad to respond. Okay, so we enter today 10 minutes uh, earlier. So thank you very much and I see you tomorrow, okay? At 7 a.m. Okay, bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.